Good afternoon. Um, well, it's been over a year coming, but I've been looking forward to the opportunity that I could stand up here and welcome Peter Cresta back to his club. So let's stand up and clap and welcome him back. <laughs> Now, um, I did a bit of research, and they reckon that most Englishmen drink about 750 drinks a year. Well, journalists are inclined to drink a little bit more. I reckon that's about 1,000 drinks that Peter's behind. So uh, tonight, uh, if you have the ability, help him on his way and buy him a few drinks, and he can catch up. Anyway, I've got nothing more to say. I'm going to hand over to Sue. Th thank you, and welcome back, Peter. Thank you, Vaughan. Well, I probably should add to that that he hasn't had a drink for a year, so he tells me one glass of whiskey would be under the table, so it won't be an expensive evening. Um, well, of course, obviously, you know, he needs no introduction. You all know who he is because he's media, although most of the time he's been oblivious to the fact that he's become this international celebrity. Um, but I think we all pretty much uh, know that at the moment we have still two colleagues who are stuck in Cairo. Um, so we are obviously thinking very hard about that. Um, Baha Mohammed and Mohammed Fahmy uh, facing a retrial that starts again on Monday. Um, so one of the things we want to do today is obviously talk about that a little bit later on. But first of all, I think we'll start with the story <laughs> of Peter's um, incarceration. Um, so let's go back to the 25th of December 2013. Um, I was sitting in the studio, the Al Jazeera studio in Doha. News was breaking that the Muslim Brotherhood were a terrorist organisation. And Peter was in Cairo. And he popped up um, in the Marriott Hotel on the balcony. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, so what are the ramifications for this, Peter? And he said? <laughs> well, he said it was quite serious. Um, you know, this was marginalizing a group that up, unt that up until then had been, well, just speak seriously, had been elected, uh, or had been the elected government, um, the first democratically elected government that Egypt had ever had. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood has been a very well organized political force in Egypt and so to see it, to have it marginalized in that way was a very significant shift in, in Egyptian politics in, in the democratic and political landscape. Um, clearly it was significant but I don't think any of us at the time, well I certainly didn't understand quite how significant it was and what it would mean for Egypt and on you know, a very personal level what it might ultimately mean for us. I mean, we were all aware of the, the, the press crackdown, um, you know, going in and out of Egypt in the second half of 2013. A lot of people have asked me, should we not have seen it coming, that this meant something for us? Did you, did you think since that maybe there, were, there was a clue? Um, I've worked a lot. I mean, we've all worked in pretty difficult environments. Um, I, I don't want to talk specifically about Egypt in this particular instance. I mean, I, and I'm going to preface it, you all need to understand that, as Sue just mentioned, we have got an ongoing trial. We've got two of our own members who are still in Egypt, although they're out on bail. Um, they are subject to the court. Um, I'm also rather, un, 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 rather surprisingly a named defendant. I don't think any of us expected that to happen. Um, so I've got to, you'll have to excuse me if I limit uh, what I say, if I edit what I say. But, um, and so in this particular instance, I think I'm going to, I'm not going to cry off, but what I will say is that we, we'd always felt, generally speaking, when we're working, um, we feel as long as you play by, if you, you, you play with a straight bat, you'll be reasonably safe. Um, I was fairly new to Egypt. I haven't had a great deal of experience of Egyptian politics. I knew, obviously, the, the broader, the broader circumstances in Egypt at the time. I knew that there'd been a lot of pressure on the press. I knew that um, Al Jazeera had had a difficult relationship. But I felt that as long as we, we stick to our ethical principles, our journalistic principles, as long as we, we don't start trying to push boundaries, particularly if I'm not, exi not uh, my instincts about where those boundaries might lie weren't particularly well, well defined, then we'd be fine. Um, I wasn't particularly worried about it. Um, and, you know, as 
most in most instances, once a journalist, even if a journalist is arrested, these things tend to come and go quite swiftly. So talk us through what happened with the knock on the door on the 29th of December. Boy, I remember that day well. Uh, um, I was finished a normal day of work. I'm not even sure. I can't, I can't even remember what stories we'd done on that day. Um, we had. I was getting ready just to go out for dinner with a friend, with a, a BBC colleague, uh, who I'd known for a few years. Um, and I got a knock on the door, and the door burst open. And about, I, think, I'm, I, I still can't remember exactly how many it was, but I reckon about eight guys burst in, and pushed me to the back of the room. Um, they didn't say anything. They didn't tell me who they were. They didn't explain why they were there. They just started going through, searching the room, <coughs> and rifling through all of my equipment. Um, gathered it all up, marched me down through the hotel. I was quite concerned at the time, but I'm not overly concerned. As I said, you know, these things happen. You have your, your brushes with the authorities. Did they speak uh, English? Um, one guy, well, they weren't speaking for the most part. They were speaking to each other in Arabic. They didn't address me directly, except when I complained. I sort of demanded to know who they were, and one guy who appeared to be in charge of it sort of said that, um, you know, it's none of my business. <laughs> um, and we sat in a room in an office. A Fami was arrested and he was put in the same room. They dumped all of the equipment and then soon after put us in, uh, in car and put us in a, in a police van and took us off to a police cell. At that point, what, what did you think would happen next? Were you sort of, were you worried in Julie? I was, I was concerned. I mean, obviously, whenever you're arrested, you're concerned. Um, you know, you can't go through that sort of thing without having a few alarm bells ring, but I didn't think it was that serious. Again, I knew we hadn't done anything wrong. I knew we, we hadn't pushed any boundaries. Remember, um, we, we, I felt that we played it safe. I, I've done this. <coughs> there, there have been plenty of stories before. There have been dozens of stories when I've pushed boundaries when I fully expected to get a knock on, do on the door from the police, when I, when I know I've, I've, I've upset governments, when I've pissed these guys off. Um, I've, and that's when you, when you start to run those, when you start to do those stories, you know that there's likely to be some kind of backlash, and you're prepared for it. Those are the, you make these kinds of calculated judgments. Um, but in this story, I hadn't done anything. We hadn't pushed those boundaries. We hadn't gone looking for, for difficult stories. We hadn't made a conscious effort to, to try and challenge the government to ask these kinds of questions. And so I genuinely didn't think it was going to be an issue. At that point, did they say why you'd been arrested? No, did they, did they no, give you any reason? no, no. I, I, I was never told. So what were the conditions like in the fir first place you were being held? Um, I, the first place was, I mean, we, I went into two police cells, and those police cells were pretty grim. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the, the specifics of the conditions, particularly under the, under the current circumstances, but generally, once we're out of the police cells and, in, and within the prison system, I have to say that we, we were broadly treated with respect, a certain, obviously a certain amount of suspicion. Um, the authorities, the police themselves, or the, the, the guards, the prison guards, the prison officers, were always... Um, we were never threatened. We were never physically threatened. I never felt... Um, that as though my physical safety was, was in danger. But the problem is that in prison, even I think under circumstances where your, your physical integrity is at risk, what really matters is your own mind, is your own head and how you cope with it. And in the, under these circumstances, um, it was, I mean, prison is, incarceration is incarceration. It's never going to be a straightforward thing. We always had the basic things that we needed. We always had a place to sleep, we always had water, we always had food. It wasn't always the greatest food, but at least it was there. Um, I'm guessing the toilet facilities weren't too nice. <laughs> Less said about the toilet facilities at that. <laughs> um, at this stage, again, you still didn't know what you were being charged with, no. and, and you had no idea what was going on outside either, I'm guessing. Did you know there was any kind of groundswell yeah. Not about really. I mean, and this, this comes back, actually this comes back to the early question, that the, the hardest part about this whole thing was the open-ended nature of it. We just didn't know when it was going to end. 
the longer it went, the more we had to push back the horizon. Um, and to the point where, towards the end of it, um, towards the end of it, I realized that I'm going to have to, uh, I would probably have to mentally prepare for, for six years, um, six more years, once, the, once we started to go down this process. The, we knew, we got, we started to get wind of a campaign. We knew that there'd been people talking about us. We knew that the press, there'd been some press coverage. But our access to the media was pretty limited. Um, we, sometimes the guards would, would tell us things that were going on. Um, we always had prison visits. Uh, the embassy, I was lucky because I was rather spoiled. I had two, two governments, two embassies. <laughs> on my case. Um, the Australians, obviously, as an Australian, but the Latvians also got involved pretty quickly. They, you didn't even know you no, had Latvia on your side? No, I, I didn't know that I was Latvian. <laughs> it, was, it was weird. I, I mean, my father is Latvian. And years ago, back in 1993, after Latvia became independent, after the Soviet Union broke up, um, the Latvians were very, very enthusiastically trying to hoover up as much of the diaspora as they could. And so, and they encouraged a lot of people to register their patriality, and I duly did that. I went to the embassy, I sort of signed a form that said that my father is Latvian, and they gave me a piece of paper that acknowledged it, a receipt and with a number on it. And I, didn't, I never followed it up. I thought, well, I'm going to have to at some point um, you know, formally apply for citizenship and, and get a passport, but I'd never done that. And, and someone um, I managed to see uh, an article, a newspaper article that had been written in Australia that described me as a Latvian Australian. I thought, holy <laughs> no. <laughs> and the Latvians, it turns out that once you get that number, you're in the system. You're, you're one of theirs. And they went through and they organized my citizenship and the Latvian ambassador showed up at the prison one day with all of the, all of the biometric gear and said, right, we're giving you a passport. <laughs> And in fact, on one day, I had both the Australian ambassador and the Latvian ambassador come and visit me. Um, and uh, the head of the prison's department, rather, just happened to drop by, uh, looking rather nervous. Um, so in fact, having, having those two diplomatic forces on my side, and the Latvians in particular were desperately keen to punch above their weight, they got the European Union actively involved. Um, and so, you know, all of that diplomatic pressure, I'm sure, also helped our situation. We, we were fortunate. We had an awful lot of attention from the diplomatic community and, and through, through your connection, Sue, with the British government, the British um, uh, the foreign, foreign Office here, um, through Fanny and the Canadians, through me and the, the Australians and the Latvians, we had a lot of diplomatic weight. The, uh, at some point, you were then put in the cell together, and yeah. the guys who had been kept in, I think, even worse conditions, uh, the Scorpions unit, were put in the cell with you. Yeah. How was that when you opened the door and there they, they were? Uh, it was quite amazing. As you mentioned, the, the first, the f I was in three prisons. We were all in three prisons. Um, Fami and Beha were together in Scorpion. Um, I was in a place called Lumen, which involves solitary confinement for the first, first uh, ten days or so. Um, and the, then we went, we were moved together into a, a prison called Mulhak, um, in a, the three of us in a very small cell, 23 hours a day in there, which was pretty tough. Um, and then we went to, after our convictions, we were moved to a third prison, uh, Mazar. Um, after being on my own for the first for the, for, the, for the first month or so during the, the interrogation process, um, it was really good to be back with those guys, to be you know, part of the team again, to, to be with the guys that were in the same case. That was, that was a good moment. What was their morale like? Because, as you say, the Scorpions unit is a maximum security prison. This is a real terrorist place to be put. Yeah, and, and Mizra was pretty serious as well. Um, the conditions there were... The, the physical conditions were marginally better. The security conditions were, were still pretty extreme. Um, you know, 23 hours in, in a very, very confined cell. Um, the exercise that we had was very strictly limited. We weren't allowed to exercise or com to communicate directly with the other prisoners. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was tough. I, I Did it make you angry? 
I went through periods of anger. I don't think you can experience something like this without, without getting a bit cranky from time to time. But the problem is that if you... I felt, and everyone has their own way of dealing with this, but for me I felt that if I let my anger take control of, of the situation, if I, let it run, if, it, if I let my anger dominate me, the only person it was going to hurt was me. You, you know, you, in, a, in a box, in a cell, in a prison cell, you can't take out your anger against anyone. Um, and if you're sharing your cell with your prison mates, it's only going to go, it's only going to be directed at them. And that's never going to be, that's never going to end well. That's never going to be a productive way of handling it. Um, and I also, one of the most important things about this, and I think this is something that comes back that everyone needs to reflect on, is that we, the campaign to support us, helped us flip the whole, the whole, the whole trial, at least in our own minds. It wasn't personal. It wasn't about us. It wasn't about anything that we had done. It was about a, um, a, a contest between the government and the institution of, of, the, of the media, of freedom of, of, of the press. And when I, once, you, once I understood it as that, it, it, once it wasn't about me, about anything I'd done, sure, the charges were against us personally. But, as I said, I didn't take it personally. Um, it meant that there there was not much to get angry against. It became a struggle, it became a, a fight of principle, but not something that that I felt I needed to get cranky about. There were days, there were some really, really, excuse me, some really black days when, you know, you sort of sink into despair. Um, but I also realized that you've just got to let that, if you, if you hold on to that, if you nurse it, if you bear it, if you carry a grudge with you, it's only ever going to turn in on yourself. When it came to the actual verdict, um, after all those sessions in, in the, the were you at that point feeling optimistic? Of course. I, I mean, we, we had ourselves to consider the possibility that we were going to be convicted. We never really seriously believed it. We'd seen the evidence. I mean, throughout the trial, I think I fully expected to have to defend my journalism. I fully expected that I'd explain why we'd spoken to the people we'd spoken to, why we'd used the quotes that we had, why I'd used the form of words that I had and chosen the story structures that we'd chosen. And I was perfectly comfortable with that. And again, as I keep saying, we, we hadn't done anything particularly unusual. We hadn't pushed any boundaries. Um, and when that never emerged, I mean, I don't know how many of you saw the, the original the, some of the, uh, the coverage of the trial, but as evidence, they presented pictures of my family holiday in, in Germany. Um, there was a news conference from, um, from Kenya. Um, there was a story that, a documentary I'd made for, some, um, for Panorama on Somalia, which somehow wound up as evidence. Don't forget the galloping horse. On the galloping horses, yes. Um, they showed a couple of rough cut stories partly cut stories that we'd sent to, to Doha. Um, but again, only never asking us to, about the stories themselves, never unpacking them. Um, there just there was no evidence. And so we, we felt as confident as we could be. We thought that, that there's no, no judge can reasonably convict us on this. So to be convicted on that day was, was, was one hell of a blow. Um, we had discussed it, but never seriously believed it would happen. We all got used to looking in at you guys inside the cage in the courtroom. What was it like looking out in that sense of Egyptian justice going through? Um, it, the whole design of the cage, I mean, part of it is, is for security's sake. Um, I think. Part of it is, is also psychological. Um, you know, the cage is, is supposed to be... It's a, security was never really a serious problem, I don't think, in the, in the court, in the open court, um, even if the cage, with or without the cage. Having the cage there presents you as, to the world, as, a, to the world as, 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 a, as a very serious danger, as someone who presents a, a, a serious and present risk to everyone in that courtroom. Um, 
And so to be inside that cage feels as you'd imagine it to be. It feels as though you are almost convicted before you, before you actually get to the trial. You feel as though you're a condemned, a condemned man. It's not easy to stare out, of that, out through that cage at people on the other side. Um, no, it was not a pleasant place to be. And the ver day of the verdict, that, that was some guessing the blackest day of all. How did you manage to um, rally, not just yourself, but the, the other two as well? Um, we, the, first, the only thing you can do, I and mean, we had a, some very dark moments then. Um, I mean, I don't think it's no big confession to, acknowledge, to admit that, you know, I, I had a bit of a cry. I think we all did. Um, you know, it, you've got to let that sort of thing go. It's, it's not, and although I don't think any of us seriously believed we'd be in prison for seven years, um, I certainly, you, you, you have to force yourself to consider that. Um, but we also, all you can do is set, the only way through is to set your horizon, is to set a target date, to set something that's manageable. And sometimes, sometimes at that point, it, it was, obviously the, 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 the appeal was going to be the next thing, but because we didn't know exactly when the appeal would happen, what you do is you narrow your horizon to, to the, the thing that you think you can cope with. And sometimes that was the end of the next week, or it would be to the next visit. Sometimes it would be simply to the end of the day. And sometimes I'd look at my watch, uh, well, the time we didn't even have watches, they wouldn't allow us watches. Um, I'd, you know, I'd say, right, one more hour, I'll get through one more hour, and then I'll think about the next hour after that. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it's a question of, of biting off the amount that you think you can chew. You talked about um, three parts of the strength that you have to keep going. Just talk to us a little bit about those three areas that you concentrated on. I always felt that we... Um, I've seen, I saw quite a few people in prison that I felt were, had been broken by prison. Um, I felt that we had to, that you had to make a conscious decision to stay fit. Physically fit, psychologically or intellectually fit, and spiritually fit. Um, if you let any of those things go, then you run the risk of winding down. Um, the greatest danger in this kind of circumstance is your own mind. And part of that, as I said, is keeping physically fit as well. It's as much a mental thing as it is a physical thing. Um, I, so we spent, I, we, we very deliberately set up a program. Um, I would start the day meditating for a while, just trying to keep my own head, keep balanced, um, keep things in perspective. The biggest danger, and I think I said this a few moments ago, is your own mind. If you let it run out of control, it'll play all sorts of silly tricks on you. You can, it, forgive my language, but you can get into a massive mind fuck and you don't want to do that. Um, the moment you spot that coming is the moment that you've got to cut it off and recognize <laughs> it for what it is. For me, the meditation was a very powerful way of handling that. Everyone has their own way. The, you know, the other guys are all, uh, Beher in particular is a very devoted Muslim and, and his prayer was, was a very significant part of that. I don't think he'll mind me saying that here. Um, Fami too has you know, had his own way. We all dealt with it in our own way. Physically, it was important too to keep fit and so, um, in each prison, we had enough exercise time to spend time out in the yard um, running. Towards the end, uh, at, um, the last prison we were in, Masrao, we had a long corridor, about 30 metres long. Uh, it was about three or four metres wide. And I spent most of, uh, most of each morning, a good hour each morning, pounding up and down that thing. Um, I reckon, I'm not quite sure how much I did, but I, I calculated that we were running, I was running about 7 or 8 k's, sometimes up to 10, 12 k's a day, just trying to, trying to keep, keep fit. Um, and the embassy also very kindly brought in a program called 5BX, which is five basic exercises. And some of you might know of it. It was designed, apparently, I was told, by the Canadian Air Force for their airmen. To, to you, so that they would, if they were ever captured in the Second World War, they'd be able to, again, maintain their exercise inside a fairly confined space. And so we used that as well. 
Um, and in fact, <laughs> I thoroughly, if, if any of you want to lose a bit of weight, you want to <laughs> get some condition back, then spend a, spend a year in, in, in an Egyptian prison <laughs> on this program. I've lost weight. In fact, I'm probably in better physical condition than I've been in the last 20 years, <laughs> tragically. Um, and you became a student and, again. And I became a student, yeah. Um, once we were convicted, up through the trial process, obviously we had an awful lot to think about in terms of the trial, and we also genuinely thought that, okay, the next hearing it'll be over, this is dismissed, and so that was as far as our horizon went. Once we were convicted, I, excuse me, I realised that we need to sit here, we're going to have to be here for the long haul, we have to prepare for the, for, to go the distance. And I figured that there is no way I'm going to be able to get through this if I don't do something with my own, with my own mind. So I, we were able to convince the prison authorities to let me take on a master's degree in international relations. And Griffith University in Australia uh, very kindly, <coughs> very kindly agreed to do it the old-fashioned way. And they printed out a massive box. Um, thir it was about 13 kilograms of academic papers, um, and they were all that was all shipped to the embassy, and the embassy all brought it in to the to the to the prison. And um, I would write, I wrote the papers out there. They had the lecture notes in that box. Um, I had a, a whole list of instructions from from my lecturer, from the professor. Um, if I had questions, I would, I'd, I'd write, again, write it out the old-fashioned way. I had paper and pencil. I'd write a letter to him. And the next week, the, emb the embassy would bring back an answer. And um, I wrote out the essays in longhand, you know, pencil and paper, and gave it to the, the embassy, who would transcribe it and send it back to, to Australia for marking. Um, are you going to carry on with the MA? Oh, yeah, with yeah. the internet this yes. time? Or are you no, gonna... no, this time will be definitely with the internet. <laughs> it, it's strange because, you know, you... In that kind of environment, you, you, you need to talk to be able to talk. When I mean, we're dealing with academic studies, you need to be able to talk this stuff through. But it seemed to work. Um, yes, I hear you got a good percentage. I, I, did, better, I, I did better than I expected. Um, look, the thing is, between, and this is the other important thing, between the, 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 the meditation, the exercise, the study, and bizarrely the cooking, <laughs> Um, we were able to create structure in the day and in, in, a, in an otherwise formless lump of time, being able to put structure and routine into the day was incredibly important. That's the only way you can, I, I think, the only way we, I felt we could get through it. You had, you had to get things done each day. You had certain objectives that you had to do. and. You had to look after each other. Um, that made it. That gave it. Per that gave the day purpose and function. At what point did you hear that there may be a change in the Egyptian law that could have such a positive outcome for you? There'd been some talk of of this presidential decree. Um, for those of you who don't know, what happened was that the, the there was a presidential decree that gave the president discretionary authority to release foreign prisoners or to, set to, to extradite foreign prisoners back to their country of origin, either to, be, uh, to serve out their sentence or to, to, um, to face trial. Now, we don't know exactly why that was drafted, although it seemed to be so narrowly defined that it could only apply to a very small number of people, and in fact, in the view of some, um, possibly even only to me. Um, we, we'd heard about this, this was I think in December. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't remember the exact dates and I'm not quite sure how, it, I, don't, I don't have a clear memory of exactly how it played out. But we were quite encouraged by it when, when it was finally signed. But it, after it was signed, we thought that the government would move quite swiftly if that's what they intended. And then nothing happened. Um, this was even this was while the appeal before the appeal had, had taken place. It was after we had formally lodged the appeal, I think, but before the appeal had taken place, and we thought that would have been the window of opportunity for the the president to exercise his authority. It didn't happen, and there was a period after Christmas when we thought this is not going to go. It's not just going. It's just not going to get used. And certainly, I think everybody watching from the outside was thinking 
that this is going to happen all of a sudden, then it, because it didn't, then it really looked like it had stalled or even it had collapsed. Yep. How much time did you get when you eventually heard you it had been successful to clear up and half ship an out? hour? <laughs> I thought um, what had happened was we had come through the Court of Cassation had hearing on on January first. Um, we it, it has 30 days to to release its its writ to explaining why it had taken the decision that it had and appointing a, um, a new court to, to deal with the retrial. We, I felt, um, or we, we, we had come past on the day that I was released, we were past the 30 days and that we still had nothing from the Court of Cassation. We also thought that the January 25th revolution <laughs> was a day when the, when the court might also, um, or when the president might also release us on, on a general pardon. Um, he, th there, there was a lot of talk that the government would release a large number of prisoners um, as a gesture on the 25th. Um, but of course, just before the 25th, the Saudi king dies and the government declares a seven-day period of national mourning and of course suspends all of those January 25th celebrations. So we had come and then we'd also just passed that seven day period and still nothing had happened. And so we had finished, we'd, we'd gone, we'd sailed past the, the day when we thought that the court would give us, would, would uh, make a ruling, we'd see some kind of progress and also the only politically um, useful opportunity for the president to, to release us under a general pardon. And so we were actually in what I considered to be open water, in both, both legally and politically. Um, and so that very morning I was, I was expecting a visit from my brother. Um, and I was going to talk to him about how we step up the campaign to get out. And I was out running. The officer, one of the officers beckoned me over and said, look, the boss wants to speak to you. I went to have a chat to him and, and he said, pack your stuff. You're going. I said, what, to another prison? He said, no, no, the embassy's coming here in an hour, get your stuff, you're going home. That was it. What were your parting words to Baha? Fami was, at the time, as hospital. you know, was in hospital. He, he had a, he's had a, an, um, an ongoing shoulder problem. Um, Baha was, was there and there were a bunch of other guys. And, and this is something else, I, I do want to mention this, and I'm, I'm slightly it bothers me a little bit that so much of the attention has been focused on me, Baha and Fami. And what we need to remember is that there are a whole bunch of others that were caught up in this case. Sue is among them. You've been convicted in abstentia. Dominic Kane, another of our colleagues, has been convicted in abstentia. How many in total were convicted? Uh, six of us in absentia from Al Jazeera. And then we have Rina, who's a and Dutch journalist. And we have Rina, exactly. Six, six Al Jazeera. Uh, in, in abstention, Rena, a seventh plus young students who were attached to our case. We only ever met them in 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 uh, in court, mm -hmm. and about two thirds of the way through the trial, an Egyptian businessman, a guy called Khaled, who just very strangely appeared in in court. Um, now, I'm also I don't want to again talk. I can't comment. I can't get in too much, involved in too much comment about, about the connection. But the fact is that we've, in all of the coverage, it's been about the Al Jazeera 3. Um, and I want to remind everyone that all of those guys are still involved. Um, I believe they're all out on bail now, those guys, the, the four others that were involved in our case. But they are also a part of this, as, as, is, as is Sue and, and the others that were convicted in abstention. So this is a much wider case than just the three of us and, and you know, whatever happens, it, you know, we need to bear that in mind. Um, so anyway, you know, Baha and I, that was, a, that was a tough day as well. Obviously I was, I was excited about, about going, but you know, you spend 400 days in a box with someone, you get to know them pretty well. Um, Baha is as, as, as close as it comes to being a brother. And I always knew that there was a good chance, we always knew there'd be a chance that one of us would, would be released before the others, and we'd discuss this. 
and we'd all agreed that if that were to happen, then there should be no doubt that they, that person should go. Um, I can't really imagine the authorities saying, okay, if you want to stay, you're fine. You can <laughs> <laughs> I don't, not that we felt we had much choice, but, you know, we, at least amongst <laughs> us, we agreed that there shouldn't be an issue over that. And yet, I've got to tell you, walking away and leaving them behind is, is not easy. Um, and I still feel, I still feel that. I still feel quite, quite anguished about it. But I, w I also know that if I was in their position, I would feel nothing but joy to know that one of us was getting out. And so, you know, we gave each other a big hug. Um, they had just told me how happy he was for me to be going. <laughs> and, um, you know, we promised we'd see each other sometime soon. Um, anybody that's followed the case has great admiration, I'm sure, for the way your family, especially your parents, have handled themselves over the last year. What was that reunion like? I know you've seen them while you were inside, but to be free and to be out there, yeah. your mum's standing there. Um, what happened was... I spent, after I was released, I went to Larnaca in, 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 um, in Cyprus with my brother Mike, who was in Cairo at the time. And um, the whole process was, was just unbelievably low key. You know, I went to the airport and um, flew to Cyprus. There was no grand reception ceremony. You know, we took a taxi, or not a taxi, the Australian, high, uh, the Australian embassy in Cyprus um, took us to, met us and took us to, to the hotel. And um, I spent a couple of days in Cyprus talking to my brother, meeting a few people. No, no real ceremony at all. And I kind of figured, oh, this is, you know, this is how it's going to be. Fairly low-key thing. No one's really going to pay that much attention to, to this. It's all very nice. You know, the news has come and gone. I've been released. That's the end of it. And um, I flew into to Brisbane. It was one in the morning. And um, I walked in and... They'd, they'd, sit, they'd organized a separate room within customs just before the, the arrivals hall where my family was. And it was the whole extended family, all of my brothers and sisters, my brothers and their wives and my nieces and my nephews and my uncle. And, you know, it was just huge. Um, I hadn't... There is a, a, a thing like this, again, either breaks a family apart, and breaks it into smithereens, or it pulls them together. And my family was one of those that that pulled it together. And to be, to be hoovered up, to be swept up in that massive embrace was just unbelievable. I, you know, I, I can't begin to tell you how important that was. Those guys were the ones that... that there are a lot of people who played a very significant role in, in getting us out. And I, again, I want to thank you, Sue, personally for a lot of an extraordinary effort that you did. The media um, who helped us, the incredible sense of purpose, and I know we're going to discuss this shortly, was a big part of it, but also my family. You know, I think anyone who's watched the recognize that my parents, my brothers, became stars in their own right. Um, and I think, as I think I said last night at the RTS Awards, I'm kind of, as much as my parents, I think, would have loved to have been here in, in London with me, there's no way I could bring them because they would have stolen the show. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, at this stage I want to ask um, Andy Smith um, if he could join us on the stage as well. So we just broaden the um, discussion out a little bit. Andy's the uh, president of the National Union of Journalists. So we'll talk about the, the, the campaign and how it worked. For just, just to sort of give us a, a bigger picture at the moment. There's been a lot of talk about the fact that journalists, as Peter so eloquently put it in a speech he wrote, are not just reporting from the front line, they are the front line nowadays. What is the bigger picture around the world, the state of affairs with journalists in incarceration? Right, I mean, I suppose if we start with the, the real blunt end, um, journalists killed doing their jobs. Um, difficult to get patterns, the numbers are relatively low. I think last year something like 120 journalists by some counts were killed, not in accidents, but actually either directly targeted or <coughs> hit in crossfire. Obviously, the places you'd expect, the conflict zones where there's insurgencies, so you've got the likes of Pakistan and Syria, Ukraine, very dangerous. Also, journalists doing their job, if their job involves organised crime and corruption, you immediately put yourself 
hugely in danger, so places like Honduras and Mexico, incredibly dangerous. And we are mainly talking about local journalists. Obviously, there are nuances there that international journalists are being targeted. Um, there are effects that we can come on to possibly about cuts in budgets, whereby we're relying upon freelancers more who may not have the training ask the questions about whether they have the training for putting themselves in the risky situations that we're expecting them to work from and give us the news that we're demanding. Um, impunity is an area where we're looking to step up campaigns that journalists are killed, people are killed all around the world. I wouldn't want to sound like a journalist death is different from anybody else's, but when it comes to whether you identify the killer, whether you prosecute, it is a good indication of the regime you're working under when you look at the sorts of the numbers where, you know, places like Iraq, Somalia, Philippines, where none of these crimes are being perpetrators identified or prosecuted or convicted. Um, if we then look at imprisonment, there is more of an obvious trend. Since the turn of the century, you know, numbers were bumping around the 100 mark worldwide where journalists were imprisoned. That's something like 200 now. Um, it's very difficult to get figures. But if you start looking at league tables for these awful things, places like China and Iran, somewhere like Eritrea, where you've got almost no coverage of the fact that there are something like 17 journalists who've been imprisoned in Eritrea since 2001. We don't know how many because we know some of them have died in custody, but we don't have the information to know who has died in custody and <coughs> who's still incarcerated without trial, without charges being laid, um, just locked up. Um, if we broaden it out to current issues. Obviously, ISIS is hugely in the news at the moment. Um, with a historical perspective, I'm not sure how different they are from other groups, but things have changed. Mm. Um, journalists are targets, um, and ISIS have used targets, journalists as targets, not only because they're seen as being valuable, <coughs> both in terms of publicity and with a monetary value, but also for their con skills. That We've seen ISIS using journalists to put across their case under duress. Um, and then I suppose it would be interesting, you know, to widen it further, you've got Charlie Hebdo and the Copenhagen attacks, which have raised all <coughs> sorts of issues of press freedom that are interesting, that have put into general discourse issues that need to be talked about in terms of conflicting freedoms, um, which it's um, certainly an interesting time. I just want to pick up on what you said about freelancers and about mm. local journalists. Um, and obviously, Baha was our local guy, a freelancer who was working for Al Jazeera. Um, lots of the campaign was centred around yourself, um, you know, award-winning journalist that lots of people recognised and knew your work. And there was a real fear that Baha could be left behind. That, you said you talked about that quite a bit, but that, I think that sometimes is the DNA of Al Jazeera, that we use so many foreign around the world, there has to be almost like a louder campaign for local guys than the big names. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to get... I mean, we, we've got to, we, we can't forget that the, the sympathy tends to go with people who you identify with. And, you know, as a, as a European, as a, as a white guy, um, it's easier for... for for white Europeans to, to identify with me than it is to, to identify with an Egyptian. I'm not suggesting for a second that that makes Baha's case any less worthy, but it just it, it, it means that's why the attention is there. If, um, and in a way we need to bear that in mind that because of that, that trend it's so, it's so easy to let local journalists slip through the cracks. Um, there are countless others, as, as you've pointed out, and one of the things that surprised, staggered me last night was that of deaths of journalists. I mean, you said it's not that many, but 
Um, I don't know how it is in relative terms. I'd be interested to know what the trends are over time. But, but it is the locals that get, that get hit, and the freelancers in particular. Um, what do you think the key things are when you are incarcerated, when something like this happens? What, what are the things, say if a journalist got arrested in a country and, and you know, we, we had a body that could react quickly and swiftly, what would be the things that you think need to swing into action? It's a good question. Um, I mean, uh, the risk of sounding like I'm trying to dodge it, there is no, there, there's no formula, I don't think. I mean, the, so much of it depends on the political situation. I think that what is clear is that there is a very narrow window of opportunity. Someone out, then you've got to get them out in the first 24, maybe 48 hours. If, you, if it's going to be longer than that, um, you've got to prepare for the long haul. So it needs very, very swift action. You can't, you can't muck about with this. Um, you've got to decide what needs to be done. That means instant communication. You've got to get lawyers on the case. You've got to get um, diplomats on the case. You need to engage and engage fast. Whether the most appropriate way is through back channels, whether the most appropriate way is, is, through, is by shouting publicly and loudly is, is a choice that's got to be made and it's got to be contingent on the circumstances. But the simple fact is that you cannot waste time. Every second wasted is a second that, that this thing it, it means that this thing is more likely to go for the uh, stretch out over a long period. We had a debate in Al Jazeera not long after they were incarcerated. Do we stay quiet? We don't want to push anybody into a corner, or do we scream from the, the hills? And we did stay quiet for a little while when you know we were hoping that it would just blow over. <coughs> what would you think the best advice is on that, or is there no best advice? I from the perspective of within the National Union of Journalists, it was very difficult. Um, on the one hand, we were in a position of wanting to do anything that was asked of us, but equally clear that it was so sensitive that if the back channels were being used, we weren't to know about it, because by definition, we weren't, know, we weren't being told. Um, as Peter says, if you don't move incredibly quickly, the politics kicks in, mm -hmm. and then it becomes such a bigger issue. I mean, I, without going into details, because obviously you don't want to, I mean, beginning of July, I had probably the, one of the most uncomfortable three quarters of an hour of my life talking to the previous ambassador in London from Egypt, who, you know, and what you said and who you talked about and how you put across your intent that something be done without sitting there and having a stand-up argument with the ambassador for a country by, you know, saying anything at all because it was anything you said immediately was pounced upon as being directly critical of the Egyptian government, the Egyptian judiciary, judiciary, the whole system, and by then it had all become so large that the other problem is that. By definition, you have no idea whether the actions you are taking are having any effect at all until they do, because they will give no indication at all that your actions are having any effect. They will do the exact opposite. They will pretend that there is nothing you can do, that it is all just the system. And all we got straight over and over again was you know, it is being dealt with, it is being processed, there is another appeal, there is this opportunity, it's being looked at, it's being considered. And to know how hard to push was an impossible question. And on that, I've been asked before now, should we have made such a noisy media campaign? Did it, did it actually, in the end, make matters worse and keep you in longer? We'll never know. Um, I think what the thing we've got to bear in mind is, is we will... It's almost impossible in these situations to be able to draw, draw a direct line between any particular action and any particular consequence. I mean, the, the, the links, the linkages are just so obscure that, that we, we simply don't know. And, and so to be able to look at what happened in our case and, and draw very clear conclusions about strategy uh, in other cases is, 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 I think, a little bit risky. But again, just to talk more broadly in the abstract, um, I think what's important is that you, you make 
a considered, you lay down a, consi a considered, you take a considered strategy and you commit to it. And that that strategy must be consistent, it must be well organized, and it must carry across everyone involved. Um, the worst thing you can do, I think, is be inconsistent. Now, if that means that you shout from the rooftops, then you go for it. That's what you do. If it means that you work the back channels, that's what you do. If you work a combination of things, that's what you do. If you have a particular message, you, again, you organize and you, you work on that. Um, what complicates things is inconsistency. Beyond that, I'd be very, very cautious about, about drawing conclusions. We don't know. We never will. Questions? <coughs> Has anybody got any questions for Peter or for Andy? Sir? My name is Andrew, I'm a freelance journalist. Just hang on, sir. We'll just give you a microphone <coughs> so we can hear you. Thank you. Peter, uh, you mentioned that the case continues even if you and your colleagues are out of jail. Is Al Jazeera, the National Union of Journalists, or whomever, going to fight hard for this case to be dismissed? Because if the case is not dismissed, all the journalists that work in the Middle East, and especially on Egypt, under, uh, are under constant threat. I mean, how, how will we publish anything and go back to Egypt and risk to be incarcerated? Yeah, we're doing everything we can. I mean, you know, and Nobody wants this case to be dismissed more than, more than I and um, and Sue and all of those of us who are directly implicated in this. Um, clearly the case is important. Um, it's, and not just within the Middle East. This, this case is resonating around the world. You can only do what you can do. Um, With the case ongoing, there's not much else I can really comment, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I take your point about its significance. Um, we've got the legal teams working on it. Um, we just have to see how the case unfolds. I'm sorry, I, there's not much else I can say on that. Another question? At the back? Uh, thanks very much. Hi, Peter. Uh, as one of the journalists who covered the trial in Cairo, it's extremely yeah, good right. to see you uh, not through the bars of a cage. Um, and, and I'm sure that the same goes for all of my colleagues as well. Um, I wanted to say that um, it, it was great to hear you mention, to, to hear uh, Andy mention as well, um, the uh, local journalists who are um, affected by imprisonment, by state persecution, by violence, uh, as much or more uh, than as foreign correspondents. And I wanted to mention in particular in Egypt um, the case of the photographer Shao Khan. Um, who's been uh, in prison now since um, August 2013, has received relatively little uh, media attention. I just wanted to encourage, since we're in a room, no doubt now, full of, of journalists, please do look at uh, Shao Khan's case. Um, there are also a number of journalists for the, uh, the online network RAST, which did some fantastic journalism, obtained the, uh, the leaked recordings of CC uh, and published them, albeit it should be said selectively. But um, their, their cases, uh, again, have received virtually no coverage whatsoever. So please, since I'm in a room full of journalists now, um, do continue to give your support to journalists who are imprisoned in <coughs> Egypt. Uh, thank you. A question? <laughs> um, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, simple member of the public. As a, I have seen it since 2003, the pressure on Al Jazeera has been growing and growing and growing since the Iraq war. My question to Peter is, next time you're in front of the camera, will the trauma of the last year, the 400 days, will affect your judgment on the way that you report an event that is, that is happening in front of you? Wow, that's a good question. Um, as I sit here, I'd like to be able to tell you no, it wouldn't affect it. It's one of those things that I'm, I wonder how I, how I will feel when I do come to stand in front of a camera. What I can tell you is that you have the trauma of, the past, of, the, of those 400 days. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that, that these things tend to play themselves out in unexpected ways psychologically, but right now I don't feel traumatized. It's been tough. I mean, if, I, if I'm sounding a bit flat, it's because I'm exhausted and knackered, <laughs> not because I'm... I'm, I'm depressed or, or, or upset or bitter by this. I don't feel bitter. 
I'm not angry. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a tough experience, but I don't feel traumatized by it. I would hope that that doesn't affect my reporting in future. Um, can I honestly say that it won't? I'll only know when I stand up in front of the camera. Do you think it's changed you as a journalist? Of course it's changed me, yes. No um, I think I've grown up a lot. I mean, as a journalist, it changed me as a journalist, it changed me as a person. Um, how it changed, it's changed me as a journalist is something I'm, I'm going to have to look at. Um, as a person, it's changed me. Of course it does. You can't go through something like this without... I'm, this is going to sound a bit weird, but I actually count myself as incredibly lucky. Um, look, excuse me. I think most people are vastly more capable of dealing with difficult situations than they imagine. Everyone in this room, I dare say, has tried to picture themselves in that cell, in that cage, in my position. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have shuddered at the thought. Um, and I'm telling you now that you would cope with it far better than you imagine. The imagining is far worse than the reality. You just, you just, you learn to adapt and cope. Now, I'm not saying every man and his dog could deal with it. Certainly some people would, would struggle more than others. But I'm pretty confident that you would be able to deal with it far better than you realize. I'm lucky because I've been tested and discovered that actually my limits are a lot further than I thought they would. I was able to put up with a lot more than I believed I could. Um, you know, and that's, that's a very empowering thing. I'll say. Yes. Hi, um, just a question in relation to somebody that I believe you spent some time in the cell with, um, Peter. Um, Ibrahim Halawa from uh, Ireland, he was, I think, about four months in a cell with you. How is he doing? Oh, pretty well. Um, you know, he's a, Ibrahim's a young guy. He was 17 when he was arrested. He's now 19. He's been in there for almost 18 months. Um, it's been tough for him, um, as it has for all of those. I, again, I, I, his case is ongoing. He's, on, he's still on, under tr in trial, on trial, um, in a very large case with, I think, about 400 other suspects. Um, so I, I can't go into those specifics. But as a person, he is, he is a, I mean, he's a charismatic young, young man. He's a big man, physically, but also in his personality. Um, you know, he's got a great sense of humor, um, and he's pretty strong. <coughs> It's never going to be easy, particularly if, if you, you're in someone like you know, in his position. Um, as I said, he is young. He hasn't had a lot of experience out in the world, but this is certainly helping him to grow up. Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, although he'll have his down days too, that he can, he can cope with whatever, whatever happens from here. Another question? Sir. Uh, William Horsley, former BBC. Great to see you, Peter. Um, uh, in one of your letters, uh, you put extremely eloquently uh, that issue of this being a matter of principle, which is of concern, not just for the journalists affected, but it's, it's for the world, really. And you, I think you said in that letter from jail uh, that you hoped that the, the public, the campaigns, all who care about these things would speak up more loudly. Uh, it is actually quite a hot topic in journalism to what extent there should be media coverage of journalists under threat and journalists <coughs> in jail and journalists killed. So in a sense, I'm cheating a bit by asking the same question as the uh, gentleman before who spoke about the case of uh, Shao Kahn. Um, you know, is it incumbent on the media uh, to focus on uh, what is the newsworthiness of a journalist in, in jail uh, in that wider context of, as the UN has very eloquently spelled out through its action plan on the safety of journalists and issue of impunity, which has got extremely little coverage. There, they've worked out there is a direct link between um, the silencing of journalists and crime, corruption, and human rights abuses. So if you feel it's appropriate now, I realize you, you may be a little constrained, I'd be Glad to hear what you have to say on that. William, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly talk in the abstract and in the general. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think that 
we have to, un there's a tendency, I think we all get a little bit tied in knots when it comes to covering journalists. Journalists covering journalists always gets us in all sorts of existential angst. Um, we don't like doing it, we feel it's a bit self-serving at times. Um, but I also think we need to recognize that we are a part of society, we are an essential bit of this thing, we are the fourth estate. And in that respect, what happens to journalists, if you step outside it, um, if you take off your journalist hat for a moment, you, you've got to accept or you've got to realize and appreciate that an attack on journalism, an attack on freedom of speech, is an attack on, on the wider society. And so I think we probably need to be a little bit more aggressive, a little less self-conscious about covering <coughs> the, the, the plight of other journalists because it does, I think, impact on, on, on society as a whole. And as you rightly pointed out, it's, it's, it tends to be a symptom of much deeper problems. Does that answer your question? I, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. <coughs> Hi, Peter. Jen Robinson. I'm an Australian lawyer and had the great privilege of being in oh, touch with your Jen, wonderful yes. parents. Yes, I've heard about you. During the course of the, good to your see case. You. Good to see you too. I wonder what's next for you because you now, I think, are such a wonderful symbol of a journalist who has suffered, has come out the other end and is speaking with such power and force on the, on the point of principle. Are you going back to reporting straight away? Are you going to be doing some of this campaigning for your colleagues? What does it look like for you now? Um, well, first things first, we've got to get through... I've got to get, we've got to get through the trial and that means doing all that we can to, to support my colleagues to get through us, ourselves as well. I mean, as I said before, you know, as, as you know, we're still formally listed on, um, in the case as, as a defendant, as a named defendant. But beyond that, yeah, I'm, I'm a journalist. It's what I do. Um, I don't, what form, what, how, what form that takes from here on, I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I, it's hard to imagine going back to, to being East Africa correspondent. Um, I don't think that's going to work at the moment, particularly given the profile that I, I have now. I don't really like the idea of reporting. You know, people will watch to see what, idiot, what stupid things Grester gets up to now, not, not so much what the news is, and that, that can't be right. Um, but I still want to report in some form. Um, but you're also right that we've got a platform. Um, I mean, the fact that you guys are here today, um, I think, is, is because of what this campaign has done. It's identified us, uh, for better or for worse, with this particular And people seem to be listening. Now, I think it would be an abrogation of, of a responsibility not to stand up, not to use this platform, not to speak forcefully and eloquently, as eloquently as I can, um, for, pre for, for press freedom. Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, and I feel like we've got that responsibility now. So I kind of see two legs of my career, both of those things. Uh, let's take two more questions. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a freelancer. I'm just wondering what your advice would be to the next generation of journalists. God, no, I, I was afraid of this question. <laughs> um, yeah, do as I say, not as I do. Um, look, you are entering this business and, you know, there are so many old hands in here, William and Peter Burden and, and all of the other <coughs> journalists who I know and have worked with over the years who will understand this, that you're probably entering the business at the toughest time in the history of, of journalism, certainly in the history of modern journalism. Um, as we've been hearing, it's, it's incredibly dangerous in, in places. It's a very difficult place. The whole business model is falling apart. Um, one of the most tragic parts of, 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 of casualties has been the amount of freelancers who've been caught up in this. And this is something that I know is very dear to Vaughan's heart. Um, the fact that it's so competitive and so difficult and the business models are falling apart that freelancers are tending to take greater and greater risks just to establish a reputation, to, to show that they're brave and courageous and capable of working in these environments. So my instinct is to say to you, um, you know, don't push it. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I, I'd caution against that. But I also know just how hard it is to break into this. Um, that's why I'm feeling really conflicted. That's what I did. I, I started by going off to Bosnia, and I was one of those stupid idiots that nearly got themselves ki killed in Sarajevo in the early days, and it was the thing that gave me my start. Um, but I, I would also be the last person who would want to encourage you to go off to somewhere, somewhere dodgy path because it has become increasingly dangerous and not just because the market is demanding, is more and more demanding, but because exactly the reasons we've been talking about, that journalism itself is, is, is becoming the front line and, and without the support of an institution or an organization, um, you going into, into a dangerous environment becomes doubly more so. If you haven't got someone to watch your back to get you out, if you get into trouble to, to negotiate a ransom, if that's what has to be done, you can find yourself in all sorts of shit. Um, you know, I, I wish I had an easy answer for that, but I just don't. OK, one more question. Hi there, I'm Milana Knezovic from Index and Censorship. Um, so we've spoken quite a bit about the local journalists. What is the best way of kind of, or the locals still in Egypt still dealing with this? What is the best way to kind of keep the momentum and keep the attention on that now? I think, um, again, without wanting to prejudice the ongoing case, um, I think, how do I put this? Um, you know what, I would rather defer this because I think some of the things that can be said might be better. Would you like to step in? Um, I think trying to keep it to generalities, I mean picking up on something William said, um, the UN is involved and is interested in journalist safety. Various organisations have identified that it is an indicator of much wider issues within society. Um, I'm trying to think who it was. Linton Crosby, when he was giving advice to prospective Conservative candidates, said about going on the media that you have to realise you're not a commentator, you're a combatant. And going back to what Peter was saying about our difficulty in covering ourselves, on some of these issues, we have to realise we're the combatants, not the commentators, and that we have to take off of our journalistic hats sometimes and look after ourselves as an industry. Um, now, I don't want to say anything specific about what's going on in Egypt right now at all, but in general circles, we have to go out and we have to advocate for ourselves, for our own safety, and making sure that we're not being put in positions where we're at risk, and that governments know that this is one of the pressures that the supranational bodies will be putting on all governments as a measure of their fitness for purpose, for want of a better word. I could, there must be a better way of saying it. But these are basic human rights. Um, they are qualified human rights, as we found out. But we, we have to push hard for our own best interests. Can I, I want to pick up on this. and this is, I think this is a, a good thing to wind up on, too. That one of the most extraordinary elements of this, and one of the things that we are in danger of losing if we do not make a conscious effort to hold on to, is the unity of purpose that emerged within the media community around our case. Um, what we did, and I spoke about this last night, we, for some reason, for, for a whole raft of reasons, and I think it would be interesting to, to try and get an academic study on this, the community right across the globe pulled together in a way that I think is absolutely unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this ever before. Um, you know, everybody was doing the Zip the Lips campaign. We had our, our direct rivals, our competitors, talking about us on air, doing, again, zipping up their lips with the free AJ staff um, hashtag signs across them. Everybody was asking about it in news conferences. Everybody was raising it consistently. What we did, what the media, what journalism, or the, the media community did in our case was demonstrate a unity of purpose and send a very clear message all over the world that this is not acceptable. If we lose that sense of purpose, then 
we lose something that's been very that, that we have created of, of enormous value. I think it's very difficult to maintain it, particularly under the, the current circumstances. But I think it's incumbent on everybody to recognise it, to make use of it, not just in our case, but in the case of every journalist that's 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 been imprisoned. It has been enormously gratifying, incredibly empowering, incredibly humbling to be on the receiving end of this. Um, and again, I, I, I recognise just how difficult it would be to to continue in any meaningful sense. I just hope that it, we can do it in some way. I think that is a perfect ending to our discussion. Thank you very much, Andy, for joining us. And <laughs> to everybody.